everybody. Hello. It's lovely to see you here. I am terrifically excited about this session. The way it's going to run is we, it's on, uh, I'm going to talk to Sparks for an hour or so, and then there'll be 50 minutes available for audience questions. So get your questions ready. They have to be questions, not statements. I know you love them, but you can't just tell me you love them. You have to think of a question, OK? I am going to start with my introduction, because I have prepared. Are you ready? Sparks are creators of beautiful and strange, chart-smashing and genuine outsider pop music. They have given us 26 albums, each one different and defined, special and unusual since 1971. Their many incredible songs include This Town Ain't Big Enough for the Both of Us, the number one song in heaven, music that you can dance to, When Do I Get to Sing My Way, My Baby's Taking Me Home, and the girl is crying in her latte. In, in 2008, in a spark spectacular, they played every one of their then 21 albums in their entirety in a series of gigs that took six months to prepare. 2015, they collaborated with Franz Ferdinand for the FFS project. And in 2021, their film Annette opened Cannes Film Festival and won eight awards. In the same year, Edgar Wright's documentary, The Sparks Brothers, came out, highlighting just how important Sparks is to, to so many other creative people, from Beck to Joy Division to Björk to Best Mode, The Sex Pistols, and Edgar himself. Last week, they released their amazing new album, The Girl Is Crying In Her Latte, and they're playing all three Primavera Sounds festivals. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ron and Russ and Mail, from Sparks. <laughs> oh, let's sit on our comfy seat. I'll have a lounge. This is this is, uh, this is symbolic here. <laughs> yeah, keep the space. OK, so um, if we think about your, the Edgar Wright documentary about you, the Sparks Brothers, one of the things that you say in the film, Ron, is that you say that the essence of pop music is, if you don't like this, we don't care. That's a really kind of amazing statement and something that would be an absolutely brilliant statement to make your career about. But it's actually quite tough. I mean, is it true? Do you not care when you make? Music. I mean, in general, it, it is the case. I mean, when we're dealing with pop music, so there has to be a certain level of reaching people or else, you know, you're just doing kind of a, a hobby on your own. But, but you know, it, it, it really, I'm not sure, you know, the mentality of other bands, but for us, you know, we feel, we take such pride in what we're doing and, and Pretty early on, we kind of felt that there was a certain sensibility that we had, and we didn't want to water that down. I mean, there, there is a certain element of uh, it being out of your control, what you, what you can do and can't do. So it isn't necessarily uh, a brave choice. It might be just that, that that's what you do. But you know, we, we really try to adhere to you know, not making compromises, because the, the saddest thing is when you do make the compromises, then it doesn't even work commercially, then, then you just feel kind of lost and, uh, you know, just, it's just really depressing. So we try to follow through on a certain sensibility, but then have different kind of uh, mechanics around it. And Russell, if you think about, say, back to the very beginning, if you think about that statement, you know, if you don't like it, we don't care. That's quite hard in the beginning, though, isn't it? Because you need people to enjoy your work in order to carry on, really, don't you? Yeah, well, at the very beginning, we were, we had made demos of our, uh, of our songs when we were just a three-piece with the two of us and a, another guitar player named Earl Mankey. And, we had made these recordings that we thought were amazing. Um, and 
we sent them out to every record label, and every record label said, thank you, when you have some new material, please feel free to <laughs> send it to us again. But there was one person that appreciated the eccentricity of what we were doing. It was Todd Rundgren, and he had been given the same tape that all the other billion uh, record labels had received and passed on, and he said there's something really special here in his mind, and he said this is what, what uh, pop music should be with all its eccentricities and not sounding like, like everybody else. So it was the first person that kind of gave us some moral support, and, and we thought, ah, oh, we actually are doing the right thing, because this guy who we thought was, we, we looked to, up to at the time and admired his work, we thought, well, if this guy likes it, then then that's cool and that's enough. So, um, you know, you just uh, we were fortunate that there was one person at that time who liked what we were doing and then said, I want to give you an album deal and record the first album, and that sort of set things going. So it's, you know, a lot of it, too, is just... Uh, good opportunities coming along that you can't predict. And also, I think early on, we emulated who, it, British bands that we really uh, admired, like the early Who and the Kinks, who exhibited, I mean, not it wasn't only the style that we wanted to rip off, but uh, they, <clears throat> pardon me, um, choke with emotion here. <laughs> they, they, they had, they, they seemed to show that, that sort of attitude, and so I think we absorbed not only the the musical influences but the attitude influences that the British bands had that that the kind of more genteel American bands didn't didn't seem to have. They they just seemed like, okay, now we're going to play something that you're really going to you know mellow down on and. And the British bands seem to not really care. And also, I mean, both those bands are kind of, particularly the Kinks, they write about specific things. They write kind of very small stories, almost yeah. like you can visualize them, don't you? Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And the Kinks, yeah. and that's very much your style as well. You tell a small a vignette of something that we can look at, there almost were, like a little pearl. We, we believe like in detail in the lyrics as opposed to, in general, a, a more uh, a wider topic like that you know if it is a song about a subject like like love or 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 somebody feeling sad that you can you can address that in ways that are more o oblique and and more really detailed but underneath you're kind of addressing the larger issue as well that actually makes me think of the girl is crying in her latte because that's like it seems like it's about one person, but actually it's about mm -hmm. all of us, isn't it? It's a, it's a it's a universal song disguised as just someone you spot yeah. in the coffee shop, right? Yeah, I mean it's it's um, you know it's specific, but then we also feel that it opens it up to you know to um, getting across that sentiment to you know to a, a bigger world as well. You know, it's basically a a girl sitting in a cafe um, crying in her lot to have she's sitting there and you don't exactly know why and the speaker in the song is saying he's, he's observing her and, and then she leaves and then another girl replaces the first girl and uh, she's also crying in her latte and so you know and we kind of thought of it more as expressing kind of you know the isolation that a lot of people are you know might be feeling and that they're there on their own and and so it you know it's specifically about that story but then hopefully it can be uh, taken on a on a you know in a, in a in a bigger sort of way and I mean I'm gonna go back to kind of the early years but actually just because we're talking about the girl is crying her latte I was thinking about Veronica Lake your latest single because that's about ve something very specific it's about an incident in Veronica Lake's yeah career where she was asked to change her hairstyle. Would you, do you want to talk about that? Because it's such a specific small event that's actually really interesting. Yeah, I mean, that one is, is kind of different in a way than the girls crying in her latte because it is really specific, but then it's also, um, 
I don't think it's uh, a metaphor for anything. <laughs> it's actually a, a, real, uh, a real story about Veronica Lake, um, who was uh, you know, a really great American actress in the 40s, and, but had a really short uh, career. And, uh, but there was one point in her career where she was so popular in the States that um, she was being, her style was being emulated by women all across America. But a lot of the women had to go and work in factories producing things for the war effort. And they would be on the factory lines and their, their Veronica Lake hairstyle would be falling into the, into the gears of the machinery and a lot of women were getting actually hurt by, by that. So the US government actually said to um, Veronica Lake, can you tone down the hairstyle somehow <laughs> And make it so that women won't be uh, that women will follow you again, but in but in fact with their shorter hairstyle. So uh, she did that, and that was it. Wasn't the only factor, obviously, in the her demise. She had other issues as well, but it was kind of played into the whole thing that that was sort of uh, you know um, her hair was so important to her career that it was kind of sad to see it go. Yeah, it's like a proper power, isn't it? Not only did it influence other women, but it was actually her superpower for herself too. Exactly. exactly. I mean, if we're talking about uh, songwriting, which we are, <laughs> then, then um, I'm interested in your process. So that's a very unusual thing to write about. I don't think that many pop bands would write about that. Uh -huh. Do you just, I mean, do you have a notebook where you think, oh, that's quite interesting, I'll just write that down, I might use that later, or how does it work? I'm not quite that organized, to be honest. So, <laughs> but, you know, we, we've kind of changed, we've kind of added to the way that we write through the years. When, when we were doing the earlier albums, it was more in a traditional way where we always start with the music because it, it seems if you start with the lyrics, at least in our terms, it locks in the rhythm of lyrics to a very strict kind of uh, box, too boxy. And, and if, if, uh, you know, if you have the music and the music is kind of not following completely strict rhythmic pattern, then the lyrics kind of have to kind of move around a bit too and I you know just for us it's more interesting that way but early on we were we wrote in a more traditional way where either there was a song that was written on a piano with some singing and a and a guitar and then brought into a studio and we would you know arrange we would have a rehearsal but then arrange you know arrange it earlier and then go in and record it but now you know, one of the advantages of, of just the whole process is that we can also write in another way where we just go in, Russell has a studio in his house now, and we've had that for about eight albums. And so we're able to just sometimes not to have a preconceived idea and just go in and maybe, you know, a, a musical uh, sound will, will kind of inspire us to come up with something. So it, you kind of, it kind of helps as far as eliminating any kind of feeling of writer's block because you can move from one way of writing to to another and so we never really feel that you know that uh, we got to take off a few days you know it it kind of you, you just shift to another way of writing and you're known for I mean you work very hard I mean you work all the time you know you obviously you're performing at the, at the moment you're kind of doing lots of different gigs but you do work hard if you're not doing a tour, you tend to be working on your next album and you do it, I mean, almost like a job, right? Yeah, I mean, for us, that's the, uh, you know, we always, we always feel if we don't have something new um, in the, you know, in the pipeline that you kind of feel naked that, you know, that it, it's always been kind of our history where we had to come up with something that would force the situation to unfold in a certain way and if and if you kind of sit back and just let things come your way we found that they usually don't but it would usually be a situation where Ron will write a song and get us out of a situation that is maybe uh more this is your get out of jail free e exactly song. yeah so you say yeah. please write a song now because we're in we're in yeah. trouble and <laughs> it, it seems like it's always worked out and I think that's partly in answering the question is just um, so we always think that you we just have to kind of keep 
keep the wheels moving and that is sort of just going in and coming up with material all of the time and and you do know. you ever find because obviously you you know you have a, a very long career and it's very unusual for siblings to get on for that long actually to be mm -hmm. quite truthful a lot of uh, brothers in bands do not get on for that long but the, i imagine that one of the reasons is because you have similar taste so if you're working in the studio do you ever, like, does, say, Ron come up with something and you're a bit like, no, I don't, I mean, please, no. Does that ever happen, or do, how do you work it out? No, I mean, it, we, we do have similar tastes, so, I mean, there'll be specifics that we may not agree on, but the, the overall um, thrust of everything, and we, we see it, you know, see it the same way, and so, so I think, you know, for our, in our minds, it's odd that there are the other brothers' acts that don't get along, you know, the... The Kinks and the Everly Brothers and the uh, the Oasis uh, Gallagher's and and all we we just think it's strange that you would be in a band and not get along. So, um, but but historically, I guess our our situation is uh, more unique. Uh, yeah. We don't we don't have competing uh, situations within the band. I mean, it's pretty clearly defined that Russell is the lead singer and that and that I'm the keyboard player and and write a lot of the things so so it isn't like i i feel like i'm being kind of left out of anything or that or that he does as well and i think maybe that that might be a problem for some of those bands but there is a big gap yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the no fly zone right here so. So let's go back to like some of those earliest. You were talking a, a little bit about um, the the earliest with Todd Rundgren, and after that kind of that time, you came to the to the UK. You were influenced by the the, the bands in the UK. You came over to the UK. You made Kimono My House, um, and in in the UK, and it was you know, it was a hit. It was a big hit, propelled by a great single. Um, that went on to Top of the Pops. I'm sure lots of people know this after one week when you were meant to be on Top of the Pops, but it didn't happen, you didn't have work permits, and then you came on to um, Top of the Pops. Um, that was an amazing time. You were selling, at that point, 200,000 singles a day. I mean, that is absolutely yeah. astonishing. That's from naught to, not even to 100, to 1,000 miles an hour. I know it's a long time ago, and I'm aware this is a cliche, but what did that feel like? No, I mean, it was, you know, it was amazing because w the two previous albums that we had um, that Todd Rundgren was involved in, um, we, all, we all loved those albums, yeah. and Todd loved them, and, um, but they didn't have much commercial success, and then Island had seen us in the UK when we went over with that original band, playing and they said they had thought that they really liked Ron's songwriting, they liked the singing, they liked our personality and characters and thought that if we would relocate to the UK that they felt that we would be able to reach a bigger audience. So they were the ones that instigated or offered us a uh, situation to go to the UK but just for the two of us and, um, and so for us that was a dream come true. We were now going to get to be an actual British band, and so, um, so then when we did, we went there, by the way, with no material at all. They were signing kind of a, a concept in a certain <laughs> way, and they had faith that we would come up with the goods, and so this town ain't big enough for both of us, hadn't, hadn't been written at the time, but they had uh, faith that we would come up with something, and, um, and we did, and so that, that, uh, that song doing so well, you know, just, uh, sort of launched everything. But for, for us, it was, I mean, it was a fantastic period. But for us also, we, you know, we didn't kind of know the difference between that and the previous two albums, why the other ones didn't work, because we felt they were equally strong. And it was just the situation that, that had changed surrounding us. We never, whenever we've written, we've never uh, pursued the song that would be the one bring us commercial success. It's always been kind of an accident, really. And so it, we're kind of uh, surprised at those moments. And sometimes it happens only in one country and not other places. Yeah. And, and, you know, because, I don't know, most bands that have some commercial success, it, 
it's either kind of all or nothing. But for us, sometimes a song like like a song that that we had written in the '80s, "When I'm With You," was only popular. I mean, it was known in some other places, but mainly it was it was France, and 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 you know, it wasn't like oh, it's time to write the hit single. It just it you know it it. I, it just happened. And also that song, This Town, uh, ain't big enough for both of us. It really didn't sound, to, in our minds, like it was a hit single. It, it was... It's a very unusual song. Yeah, yeah. And to their credit, Island Records felt, said we should release that one as opposed to one of the, the other ones that was more traditional with a, a verse and a chorus in the middle eight that sounded like, oh, that sounds like a, uh, a hit song. They went with the other one, which was bold at the time and we 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 appreciated the fact that they wanted to kind of throw everything at it and just say we're gonna this one is so unique that it it has to work you know? yeah it's it's interesting because it is an exceptionally unusual single i think and then it was kind of launched well in britain at least by your top of the pops appearance mm. and kids of the time were really kind of wild by what you you both looked like i think but it's also interesting to me because I can hear in quite a lot of your work, a song will then kick something else off. So when I think of, of that song, I kind of actually think of kind of Queen's song, but later on, so that sometimes your influences kind of pop up in things later. And I'm not sure if it's conscious or, or people steal things in the way that people do, <laughs> but it do, they do seem to pop up later. And I wondered how you've felt about that, you know, that because it's on one level amazing to be influential yeah. and another level slightly galling. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I mean, the, in the Edgar Wright documentary, um, he was amazing to have, a, who have gathered this uh, cast of creative people that spoke about Sparks and in a lot of cases the influence that we've had on them, and so when when you kind of hear it now after the fact, I mean, it's it's really satisfying to know that that what we were doing, that actually other artists were listening to it, and if they they were either being influenced by it or ripping it off, however <laughs> you, you want to look at it, um, you know, in a certain way, it's 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 flattering that uh, that people were out there. And with the documentary, we were especially happy because it was artists from different kind of genres of pop music that found something from a, from different eras of Sparks too. Yeah. You know, there's, there are the ones like, uh, you know, the New Order folks that, you know, were listening to Number One in Heaven album, but then there were other ones, uh, you know, that, that responded to earlier stuff to the more... I mean, the Sex the, Pistols, yeah, they, they were listening to Kimono My House, which is yeah. kind of, like, amazing to me, you yeah. know. Exactly, and then, then there's ones like, uh, even like, Vince Clark from Erasure, yeah. who, who, despite him being electronic, he was he was listening to, you know, Amateur Hour and This Town and stuff. Mm. So it's kind of all over the the map as far as um, which albums of ours people were listening to. And then there's like Jack Antonoff, who uh, was too young to have listened to any of them, and and <laughs> came in later and uh, got the whole uh, the whole catalog at once. So. But if you if you get bitter about those kind of things it's paralyzing you know so we try to just kind of you know if, if you're in a kind of a down period it's difficult to hear something that is reaching more people with something that you know you might feel you had some influence on but you can't it can't just you can't just kind of stop you just have to just move on and and come up with something else that uh, somebody else will rip off yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you, like, if you think about that documentary, the Edgar Wright documentary, it's a beautiful documentary. He's a great filmmaker. I'm sure it was incredibly enjoyable to, to do. Do you feel like it, that, I mean, there's an element of it where you felt like all these people who were talking about it outed themselves as Sparks fans, you know what I mean? Yeah. For different kind of reasons. And it led to another, I feel like it led to an, a whole other audience. Is, is that how you experienced it yourselves? Oh yeah, I mean we were we were happy that they all were willing to speak about Sparks because for 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 so long, you know, you, we kind of didn't know where we 
fit in amongst other musicians and stuff. And Edgar, it, it, it took Edgar to kind of go out there and go, uh, you know, hey, Duran Duran, you like Sparks, don't you? And they go, well, yeah, duh. Um, you know, <laughs> and, and so he did that with so many people, not only uh, musicians, but like with, you know, writers like Neil, Neil Gaiman, Gaiman and, yeah. and all who's discussing Sparks, the, uh, the, the meaning of some of our album covers and, and stuff like that. So, so, you know, it took Edgar to go out there and, you know, kind of attract all of these, uh, these people to, to speak about, uh, you know, what we've meant for them. And so it was... And what was it like watching... I mean, because you have to watch it yourself, don't you? I mean, that's the deal. You must yeah. watch it. What was it like watching it? Yeah, I mean, for the, the first time, we were, we were shocked. I mean, it was even before it was finished when, you know, Edgar would tell us, um, you know... Tomorrow, I'm interviewing Mike Myers for the, for the documentary. Said, Mike Myers, what is, <laughs> he, he can't like spark, surely. And, you know, and then every other day, he would tell us somebody else that was going to be interviewed. And we just, you know, so for us, it was kind of, it was so heartwarming to hear that there were these people out there in the, in the, uh, the real world that were listening to what we were doing. We had been approached by quite a few people earlier about doing a Sparks documentary, and we always declined just because we thought that our music really is what we want to convey as far as what, who we are. But um, Edgar, I mean, first of all, is our respect for him as a filmmaker, but also, and, and his passion is like kind of, you know, just uh, incredible. But he, he also said that he wanted to not think of Sparks as like a golden era and then mm. other kind of things that happen either later or earlier that, that he felt that, the, you know, whether this is true or not, but he felt that there was a strength to all the different periods that we've done. And so that, that was something that we, we were really happy that got across. You know, you can make an assessment whether you believe that that's the case, but it's how we feel and it's how we've been able to kind of sustain what we're doing, always believing that what we're doing at that present time has, has some worth. Has more, yeah, more than some worth. I mean, he kind of puts it in different phases. I'm going to go to the next phase that he puts in, which is number one in heaven, and you work with Giorgio Moroder. And that's, a, I mean, that was a very, you know, people have worked with Giorgio Moroder since, you know, but like it's, that was a, an, an important move for you, wasn't it? Because it was a move out of a a certain way of making music, to work with somebody like him, who is, an, you know, a, a, obviously a respected producer, but was making different music. When you work with someone, like, he's an exception, it's very important, but when you work with new people like that, obviously you're learning, aren't you? What do, yeah. you, what do you feel like you learned from Giorgio Moroder? Yeah, well, at that, at that point in our career, we'd had the, the, few, the albums that in, from the UK, which was a traditional kind of band format with guitar, bass, and drums. And then we just were always kind of just, um, you know, yearning for something, something beyond, something different. And, and we, we had heard I Feel Love, and we thought that was just an amazing record. And we just thought, well, what if, you know, we were in a different context that wasn't necessarily guitars, bass, and drums, but that kind of electronic thing. But we, we didn't really know how to achieve that and we said well what if we just uh you know go to Giorgio directly and then we told a little white lie and said to a journal German journalist that our next album is going to be with Giorgio Moroder but we hadn't even spoken to him yet and she said I know uh oh really Giorgio is a friend of mine he hasn't mentioned that yet and we said oops um busted and so uh but she did introduce us to him and he wanted to he really liked what we had been doing. That's called manifestation these days, no? It, like yeah. you go, I want this, and then it happened. I know, it just, <laughs> it just happened magically. So, uh, so fortunately, with our, our little white lie, we were able to reach Giorgio, and he was anxious to work with a band, too, because he hadn't worked with any bands before. It kind of preceded all, you know, Blondie and yeah. Human League, stuff like that. So, um, and... And he liked the idea there was just, you know, the, the two of us and we'd kind of, and he didn't know, he didn't have a real idea what that album was going to sound like either. So it was the three of us kind of going, I don't know. And, um, 
But that's so great. That what a lovely thing. Yeah, no, it oh, is because that, that that's the, always the most exciting times for us. They're they're scary, but they're also exciting when you go. I don't know what this is going to be, but it it will make it it will make it into something uh, special. And so Giorgio went at it with that same attitude, and we all kind of just cobbled away the stuff. And we did learn lots on the electronic end from him because uh, we we didn't know. Uh, our way around a you know a Moog synthesizer at the time, but uh, learn from the best. Yeah, well, exactly. And now you, it's easy. <laughs> it's easy. Um, I want to talk to you. We, we've kind of vaguely talked a little bit about the different phases. There was a time when you that. It, then when things were difficult for you, and it was mostly because you were you were slightly sidetracked into film. There was an idea that you were going to make a film with Tim Burton, and films take ages to come about, don't they? They just take ages. So you can write things, you can tweak them. Then somebody else says this, and then then you're getting the money together, and it coincided with a time perhaps when the music was not quite so much in the forefront. Mm. And then uh, after that fell apart, you picked yourselves up. But what I wanted to know really was what that time. Uh, helped you understand about yourselves as artists and what you took from there because there was a time when it felt like felt fallow because you were concentrating on something else. Well, I think one thing is that we realize that if, even if we're working on a project that is, you know, outside of the Sparks songs, yeah. three and four minute songs, that it's important for us to not put everything into that. Like, I mean, we put everything into it as far as, you know, what our passion and all, all of that, but, but not, not to kind of abandon uh, mm. what, what is our strength and what our, our real love is, which is pop music. And so, so we realized that, that, you know, it was kind of a hard lesson to learn because we thought it was, a, it was a, based on a Japanese manga, My the Psychic Girl, and we thought, this is going to be the next Sparks, Sparks phase, you know. And but uh, we so we kind of left, in a way, pop music for for the, the four years. But then we realized that 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 it they they don't have to be two separate things. You mm. can be working on on both kind of things at once. And so since that time, whenever we've worked on something else like Annette, uh, we've always kind of maintained our you know our are thinking that that we will be doing pop songs, and you know we're we're fortunate. Just uh, you know, I don't know exactly why it is, but we we still think that pop music is an amazing. Just uh, you know, you hate to use the word genre, but just you know, just that 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 it's as strong as any other kind of form of of music, and there, despite there being such limitations as far as the length of things and and you know a certain kind of familiarity after you hear something one time that needs to they tell us to be there uh, that that there are kind of endless possibilities and it's always it's always a miraculous thing to me not only through us but just to hear somebody else doing a song that you you know that just kind of just is like such an you know how did how did they come up with this and you know this hasn't been heard before despite there being you know millions of pop songs being done before so so we all will always re return to that you know and it but for us i think it helps working in those other areas because you you return to the pop music uh knowing the strengths of what that really really is and and with more energy i think and we learn too with films um it's sort of obvious but you don't realize it really at the time that it's it's more of a collaborative process than just being in a band that well we kind of it's a dictatorship with <laughs> with our band uh with and the two of us are kind of the you know co-dictators of of sparks but when you're working on a film project like we did with Annette, um, even though it was our original idea and all of our music, that at some point you have to relinquish some of your creative um, oh, energy. Yeah, and it's it's hard yeah. it's hard to do that because we've never been in that situation where we've had to relinquish anything. Um, 
musically or creatively. And so, but then the, the flip side is if you, you're working with a great director like Leos Carax, the French director who directed Annette, and his, his also passion for Sparks. Um, so it was, it was um, you know, as good as great a situation as it could possibly be. But then he's also a really strong director and has a lot of ideas. So, um, so that's the, the flip side of doing, you know, doing music within a uh, movie, uh, you know, the movie process. I mean, in, in a certain collaborative. way, like even working with Georgia Moroder, there's a certain element of that where you're, you're working with somebody that you know is kind of a master in something, but, but that it's they're, what they're bringing to, to you is something that, that maybe will, you know, be something very interesting. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things also you've talked about is um, the power of the delete button, and I know that you know that you can do a project and then just think, you know what, this isn't what we want to do. So I know, f for instance, that after say uh, you did an album called Balls in two thousand, then you did a whole other album and you press the delete button on it. Um, that's quite a strong thing to do. I mean, it's obviously the right thing to do because then you did little Be Beethoven, but like that's a it's a strong thing to do if, uh, if, if pop music is what you want to be making. Yeah. How did you know to go? Yeah, well, well I mean... It, yeah. No, go, go ahead. It was, yeah, I mean, it was almost like the... Uh, it was different, but a similar kind of idea that when we started working with Giorgio, of just mm. wanting to kind of erase everything you'd done before and try something different. And so there was a similar kind of situation at that time where... We did have another album ready, sort of, and then we were thinking, God, just another album, and that wasn't kind of enough for us at that time, and we just felt like we just wanted to try to shake things up for ourselves creatively, and then hopefully that would also shake things up for the outside world, you know, in their perception of what Sparks is, and so we then did that album, Little Beethoven, and um, with the thought process being that we would kind of get rid of all of the trappings of normal pop bands. There would be no guitar. Well, there, there's a few exceptions on the album, but basically no guitars, no drum, no yeah. traditional rock drums, and no bass guitars, and they would be replaced by these uh, really thick and aggressive vocals and thick sort of um, string, string parts you know, and all kind of, we wanted it to not be a soft album. We wanted to still have the aggression of a, of a traditional band, but to be done with different instrumentation. And I, you know, I don't know if we've learned that many things through time, but the one thing that we uh, picked up is that we're able to kind of step outside of, of our, ourselves and be able to look somewhat objectively at at what we've written and know whether you know it really is top notch or not at least in our top notch in our terms i mean it, that's a very subjective thing but and so at that time you know it just didn't it just didn't seem right yeah it's interesting because then it also be, became out with one of your i think one of your most strong songs which is my baby's taking me home and it's actually I mean, if I described it, it would sound weird because you just mm. say, my baby's taking me home mm. a lot. <laughs> and then the music does its thing. But, the, you know, that's an amazing, for me, it, it is mm. a pop record. Mm. And yet, if you wrote it down, it doesn't sound like a pop record at all if I was to describe it in the layers of what it does. But it is an incredibly moving mm. pop record. Mm. So in the end, mm. it works, right? No, it, I mean, it did in, in our terms. The other interesting thing about that album, uh, for the, in, the, um, in certain territories, it was... Um, Chris Blackwell, who was the head of Island yeah, Records yeah. Um, when we first signed for Come On To My House and that whole period of ours, he then went on to create a label called Palm Pictures. It was a film company and also a label. And he caught wind of the little Beethoven album. And the same way that he responded to this town, being enough for both of us now, years later, he was it, he had heard um, the first song off a little Beethoven called The Rhythm Thief, and he said this, is the kind, this song hit him the same way that this town did at the time. And so, you know, several years later to respond to what we were doing musically in the same way, but with a completely kind of different approach, but something kind of 
probably just as idiosyncratic as this town was at the time of the Rhythm Thief. Um, it was really satisfying, and he, he then again, uh, you know, wanted to be, have sparks with him again. Yeah, quite right. Should we talk a little bit, given that we're at Primavera, um, I'm going to ask this one question, and then I'm going to throw it open to you, audience. So this question about life, okay? So, you know, you obviously, you know, we can imagine you making your music in, in, your, in whatever setup it is. You do lots of different types of setups now, really, because you work with other people. When you take your music out live, you play songs from all eras. There are some songs that people want to hear, perhaps, you know, the hits or whatever, but you literally can play a song from your first album and songs from your new album that people may do, maybe don't know, and they all seem to work together, right? Is that, I mean, obviously it's planned, but, <laughs> you know, that must be very satisfying. No, it, it is that um, we kind of learned that, the lesson almost when we did that 21 Nights thing, that um, it made us almost reassess some of the older albums that had kind of slipped through the cracks and weren't that visible to a to a big audience, but then when we revisited them in a live context, we thought, God, that song's not that bad. Um, or the audience must respond to them in different ways it, Exactly, as well. exactly. And we're finding that's the case now, where we kind of are inserting into the live set some older songs that maybe even aren't even the, uh, the most known off of the obscure albums of our, more obscure albums of ours, but, but ones that we just like as songs. And, so we're finding that, that everything does sound of a piece, that it doesn't sound like, oh, that's an old song and here's a, a current song, that, that we can kind of have them all sort of juxtapose with each other and that they all kind of make sense and it, it doesn't sound like um, there's the 70s songs and there's the 2023 songs. And so we're, we're for whatever reason, um, the stuff, the older things seem to, kind of sound timeless in a, in a certain way. Yeah. And the other thing is just that the reaction to things is changed. I mean, one of the advantages, the positive things kind of about just viral situation is just that, that you know, when we first were in England and then moved back and, well, we played in, in Los Angeles. And so we would do things like, you know, at this sounding big enough for both of us and at home and work could play. And the audience didn't want to know about that. They only wanted to hear things that they had heard on a local Los Angeles station. So, but that, that really has changed now. And things have, uh, I think in a positive sense, at least in our, I mean, for everybody, just that, that there is like a worldwide kind of feeling about, about things. And it, and it isn't quite, I mean, I guess in certain sense, it's kind of sad that there isn't kind of a, you know, a, a national sort of sound or whatever, but but I think you know, it, for pop music, it really is more universal now, and it, and it, that's one reason why, you know, we we're so comfortable playing things from all different areas and maybe songs that were at the time only popular in one place because they people know them now. Yeah. The other the other dilemma is that we have 26 albums, so <laughs> we found that our Which set one's point? <laughs> our set is maybe about. 22 or 23 songs seems to be about the right number for some reason. So to decide which ones don't to get any treatment out. at all, it's, it's, a, it's a tough mm. decision, yeah. So. <laughs> which one of your babies do you have yeah, to exactly. just leave behind? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so look, can we have some light and I can see the lovely audience and then we can see if there's some questions. Oh, look. There we go. Sparks, there we go. You're, you, do you want to hold it up? Oh, look. Oh, look. It's <laughs> oh, our look, new what album. Oh, look, can this be? <laughs> oh, look, it's a picture disc. <laughs> and there she is crying into her latte. She's crying in her latte. Oh, look, it's more expensive than the non picture disc. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's uh, see, let's see the lovely audience, and we'll, um, I can vaguely see you. Do we have a microphone anywhere? Hello, how are, hello, how are you? Uh, let's hear from you. I have a question for Ron. Um, as somebody who writes such clever lyrics, how do you feel about people coming to you and ask what are they about? <laughs> like when, when they don't get it, how, do, how does it yeah. make you feel? Well, sometimes it's, 
it's difficult because they don't want to, even though maybe I had an intention writing a song, I kind of don't like to insult somebody else's, uh, if, they're, if they also draw, if they draw a different kind of conclusion from it, I mean, that's what they're getting from it. So I don't want to say that they're, they're wrong. So I kind of just shake, shake my head, you know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, sometimes with journalists where it kind of is, it seems like, like they're completely missing the point. Maybe I'll make a comment. But if it's, if it's like somebody that's, you know, a, a fan or, or is passionate about our music, I think it's, it's valid what they're, what they're taking from the lyrics because you know it isn't it isn't right or wrong maybe it's not what i i think but but if they're getting something specific out of it then i'm i'm fine with that yeah it's your baby is left it's yeah doing its thing. yeah it's, um okay i see you hello and then i'll uh, go this side this is a question for for you um we know that uh, the the more successful album of of your career are Kimono My House, Propaganda, and Indiscreet, the, the UK trilogy. But uh, what is the album that you feel more done, more uh, satisfied, that you, you say, wow, this is a masterpiece. We, 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 do it, we did it some, uh, so well. Well, I, I think the basic premise is maybe not uh, correct that you, you know, just that those are the three most successful, that uh, depends what era you've entered Sparks by, um, so, because a lot of the new, newer, younger fans that have come on board for Sparks would say the most successful albums are, you know, uh, uh, Hippopotamus, or, uh, you know, A Steady Drip, 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 or even the, the new album. So it's, it depends what, you know, what, uh, you know, what your kind of, uh, point of entry point of references, I think. So I, I think we, we just wouldn't maybe say that the three most successful albums are those ones. But I mean, to further, you know, answer somewhat uh, your question, I mean, we, you know, there's different periods that have had something special that, that we feel, you know, that, that have had something that was really unique, you know, even, um, when do I get to sing my way was probably more successful commercially than any of the three albums you you mentioned, and so that was a really you know it meant a lot to us because it was almost like what's happening to Sparks now in a way that um, a lot of new people are finding the band and a lot even that haven't heard of the band don't know any of the history, but even with When Do I Get to Sing My Way, they thought it's a brand new band, and they responded to that song and really just loved it, and it was particularly in Germany was the, the biggest success of that song, but we're finding the same things kind of happening now, and so um, uh, that, that for us is kind of really satisfying. And, you know, the, you know, some of the eras we did, talked about with, you know, Number One in Heaven was... Mm -hmm was a unique era and uh but it's beta. also interesting i think now because you you if you think about things like the, you mentioned journalists music journalists before that like say for instance number one in heaven wasn't particularly like uh, well received at the no. time and then it was well received later it was well, like almost sometimes some of the, your work is appreciated later on no you know? ab absolutely number one in heaven when it was released was crucified by the uh British press in particular, th <laughs> Not saying... Me. I wasn't older. <laughs> <laughs> they were saying that we were uh, blasphemous to the, you know, the rock cause. We had been a rock band. <laughs> but the really satisfying thing was the public thought differently, and there were three hit songs off of that album in the same UK. So sometimes the uh, public is uh, smarter than the critics. How could you say? I'm sure you're right. Okay, I'm going to go, yes, I see, okay. I'm going to go this lady, and then I'm going to go to you, and you, and you, okay? This lady first. Uh, so, in one of the recent interviews, I think it was for Vari Variety, sorry, I can't really pronounce that right, uh, somebody, well, the interviewer asked um, if Edward Hopper was uh, influenced for you um, 
for the narrative perspective of uh, the, gra the girl is crying in the latte. Mm. Uh -huh. And also Miranda here was mentioned the vignettes as uh, the point of departure for many of the lyrics. So, and when I read the lyrics and then when I saw the video, uh, the way you, you arrange for the things to happen in the foreground and in the mm. background at the very same time, the composition, the style, the visual mm. style, I kind of thought of a mm, Swedish director, I don't know if that was actually my question, if mm. you know him, if you like him, Roy Andersson, um, who is known, who is also compared to Edward Hopper and whose influence comes more from mm, paintings, from working with a uh, depth of field and things happening simultaneously. Mm. And also mm. it's, he combines this humor and absurd tone with mm. much more serious, um, aspects or I, I don't know. Yeah. So my question is basically, do you know Roy Anderson? Do you like him? And what other um, movie directors have you been recently uh, finding interesting? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, that, we're not laughing at you. We're, uh, yeah. at you. Yeah, we're I, the, the, the thing about uh, Edward Hopper was it was, it was unusual because we had done the, the album cover um, and then Ron had discovered that Edward Hopper had that, the painting yeah. that you're talking about. It's um, called The Automat. Yeah, and it was really, we, lo we, a, we didn't a, know a that. A isolated girl with her coffee cup looking almost like she's crying in it. And, and so we were, we, were, uh, we were really intrigued to see that, that, uh, that painting of his. And uh, so, uh, and the other person you mentioned, I don't know. I I don't know him. Do you know him? Roy, Roy Anderson, Roy Anderson, a, oh. a Swedish movie director. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I like I like his films. Yeah, I mean we're, you know, film is just in general has always been such a, a big part of our experience. I you know it's always hard to just we don't kind of use film. Uh, and pour it into our, our music all the time. Obviously, a reference like Veronica Lake is a direct thing, but, but I think that just cinema in general, where, where it's kind of large, where things are sometimes larger than life and, and very uh, specific and, and, uh, and just where you can see something, that, that's really important in what we're doing musically. We always can kind of not necessarily see the lyrics being acted out in the songs, but there's just kind of a, a sometimes a vague visual element of what the song is. So, you know, we it it's been meant, you know we mentioned in the documentary and all, but just film has always been uh, important to us. I mean, Russell studied cinema at UCLA, and uh, so it you know it it has to have some major influence on us, but I, yeah. I like him as a director, yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, the first Swedish director, obviously, that we ever, you know, learned about was Ingmar Bergman, and just, and uh, it was at the time that we discovered all the French New Wave films, we also discovered his films, and, you know, it's a whole, a whole other world from, you know, we grew up watching Hollywood movies, uh, cowboy films and war movies and to then kind of shift to seeing those kind of films it was the just the idea that that there's another way of doing something i think was influential that even within pop music there's another way of of thinking about the the whole area yeah okay so you were next <laughs> thank you hi uh, my question is like uh, it's it's uh, obviously the longevity of the band, but it's like a thing that we don't really talk about is when you have you have we talk about the highs, but we don't talk about the lows. Like it's interesting to me how you manage to keep the project going and never let it go, and it's it's a uh, it's a testament to how you perceive the band and how, how much you believe in the project. And I want to know like what. What what were you what were you doing? What was the, the thoughts process and the work process when when the, the bands were at, at its lowest point, and what made you keep going? And obviously later, 
how sweet it is to feel validated at, at, yeah. the, at the newfound success yeah. again. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I guess we're just so passionate about what we're doing and we kind of have blinders on too in a certain way. So we, you know, you, you just, uh, we don't like, you, you know, we, um, we're very insular and so we, when things aren't going well, we kind of, there, there's nothing else we want to be doing but we know we want to be creating something, so there's no option other than, well, let's do something else. And I think I, I mentioned it earlier that, that sort of the thing of if we sit around and do nothing, then probably nothing is going to happen uh, surrounding the band. You know, we're not going to, we can't sit and wait for some, uh, you know, divine intervention to happen that it usually happens because of, we do a song or the situation even with Annette, the movie, for example. Um, no one was asking us for, have you got a movie? We, we did that album, which is a narrative album. This was before we gave it uh, to, to Leos Carax to hear. But we, we thought it was going to be Sparks' next album was going to be this narrative with that story of Annette. And then just by chance, we went to, to Cannes for another project that we were trying to get off the ground. And, and Leos Carex had used a Spark song in his previous movie. And, and then um, someone had said, would you like to meet him? We said, oh yeah, it would be great. We met him, got to talking with him, and then we got back to LA and we thought, let's just send him that, uh, that, that project. And then he responded and said, this is amazing. I wanna, I wanna direct it. So just things happened, but the way it happened was that we had said, well, let, let's just do a narrative album. And we didn't know what it was for. We didn't know if anybody was going to respond, but we thought, well, at least it'll be a, a different next album for Sparks. And um, then it just morphed into becoming a movie that then has Adam Driver starring in it, and we're sitting on the red carpet in Cannes. So just, you know, things happen, but I think it happened because we, we decided to keep busy through thick and thin, you know, and sort of, I hope that sort of answers your... Uh, That's up to your, you guys. Your question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's so many questions, but I'm being told, I've been told to wind it up. Um, are we winding it up? Oh, so many questions. One more, okay. All right, I'm going, I would like to have a lady ask a question. So. A very quick one. Um, it's very easy to get overwhelmed with your discography as with, with Frank Zappa's collection. You open Spotify and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> where, where do you start? For, you know, a recommendation for a new listener, let's say. Uh, you can start at the beginning well, work all the way through. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> what we, you know, even with the new album. On this, That's the new uh, album. <laughs> that that um, we kind of go at things where if someone has no idea of what Sparks is, we would like to think that the latest album, and we're that proud of it and that passionate about it, that that kind of encapsulates the essence of the band and is equally, in our minds, just as strong as anything we did way back when. So as an entry point, we would hope somebody that's new to Sparks would just pick up on the latest album and, and that that would be their entry point to then going back and discovering other other albums of ours and so maybe that, they should start backwards yeah starting yeah. backwards is fine Go and i way. think that 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 was one of the dilemmas uh that a lot of people mention with uh not not a bad dilemma but with edgar wright introducing to the world to a bigger world um sparks was that we have a lot of people asking that same question is like well wow they have 26 albums or 26 <laughs> now albums and and like where do, I, where do I even begin? But it's not, a, for our, in our minds, a, a bad problem to have that someone doesn't know where to start. But, but we would say start with the latest and then go through the, uh, go through the others. As you Edgar Wright about. said that his first album that he ever discovered, the, the album that he discovered sparked through was number one in Heaven album. And then so he kind of went backwards from there at the time. So it, uh, it kind of is different for whatever period and the, the person. 
Exactly that. So you start with that one. I don't know if you've seen it. There's a picture disc here. <laughs> oh. You could start with oh. that one. That's and the that correct answer from a managerial perspective as well, <laughs> just to get <laughs> some sales. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Exactly that. Okay, so look, I'm going to wind it up now. I'd like to say thank you to, for being a lovely audience, for remaining wrapped during the talk. Um, I hope you have a fantastic Primavera. Go and see Sparks. They're playing tomorrow. And um, I'd like to say thank you very much to Ron and Russell Mail, the fa fabulous Sparks. Okay, let's go.